My name is Visto Ndashimie, and uh, this is an interview by Change for Concord, interviewing our candidates, uh, only for at-large city councilor candidates and mayor uh, uh, candidates. And uh, let's hear from uh, our mayor candidate. Uh, I want to know about you. I want to know why you're running and uh, what you want to change in our city. Sure. Well, thank you, Fiston. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, my name is Byron Champlin, and I'm running for mayor. Um, I've been on the city council for 10 years. The first uh, five and a half years, I represented Ward 4, which is where I live and my family lives. Uh, the last four and a half years, I've represented the entire city as an at-large councilor. Um, I've been living in Concord for 40 years. Um, I uh, came here to go to work for the state legislature, and I worked there for seven years. Then I worked for Colby Sawyer College in New London for three years, but I lived here during that time. And then I spent 27 years with Lincoln Financial Group and its predecessor companies doing marketing communication and, uh, and corporate philanthropy. Uh, so uh, you know, what I'd like to accomplish is uh, I would like to uh, ensure that our tax uh, base grows uh, through economic development, which I think you're going to talk about a little later. Um, I would like to uh, make sure that we have a strong public safety uh, uh, structure in the city. Uh, that means police and fire. Um, I want to make sure that we're a welcoming committee uh, and address issues of DE, uh, the DEIJ issues uh, that I know uh, you want to talk about. Um, I also uh, want to uh, be very careful about how we spend taxpayer money uh, because uh, as I've gone around the city and talked to a lot of people, uh, one of the things I've heard over and over again is a concern about uh, property taxes and the impact they have particularly on our retired people who have a fixed income and don't have, aren't getting a raise necessarily uh, every year. So that's who I am and those are some of the issues uh, that I'm concerned about. Oh, and housing because, you know, uh, and homelessness, which all ties into, uh, housing ties into economic development, uh, but also it ties into addressing homelessness because we can't move people out of homelessness unless we have someplace for them to go. Hi, I'm Kate West. I'm running for mayor of Concord. I'm running because I've found that positions of representation within our municipal government have been inaccessible to a large swath of people myself included. It's typical that in order to be in a position like mayor, you would have to have money. Um, at times, you are likely retired, and you would have to have transportation. Uh, there would have to be childcare if you have a child. There are a lot of barriers to access for serving in a role like that in our community. And so in spite of those barriers, I am doing my best to campaign in order to be able to fill one of those positions. My name is Kevin Porter. I'm a candidate for one of the at-large council seats. I live in Ward 5. I work down here in Ward 8, and I have family in Ward 7. So I thought running for one of the at-large seats would be a good way to work for the city as a whole. Uh, I currently work for a national organization based here in Concord called Rock USA. We work with homeowners in mobile home parks to buy their communities and operate them as co-ops. And uh, th this sector of community development finance is something I've been in for about 20 years. Uh, community development financial institutions, or CDFIs, grew out of the civil rights movement to expand access to capital to meet needs that were not being met by the traditional channels. Um, started off my career in small business lending, but for most of my career I've been in housing, so affordable housing, workforce housing, and also energy efficiency uh, lending for single and multifamily housing. Uh, building off of that experience, I served on the Board of Clean Energy New Hampshire for six years, including two years as vice chair. Uh, my wife is born and raised here in Concord, and we have two young boys that go to Krista McAuliffe School. Hello, my name is Judith Kurtz. I'm running for city council at large. I am very grateful to be here today and for this opportunity to answer some questions and talk with each of you. Thank you. Um, you said tell us, um, would you tell us about yourself and why you're running? Sure. I'm running for Concord City Council because I would like to take my public service to the next level. I've been volunteering and organizing around issues of sustainable development, equity, and local climate action around Concord for the last two and a half years. I have gotten to know many wonderful citizens of Concord, and I believe that I have something to offer uh, as a way to give back to the people of Concord. 
My background is in education. I was an educator for 17 years, uh, both a classroom teacher, a tutor, and most recently a school librarian uh, media educator. So my name is Taylor Hall. I'm running for city council at large. Uh, so the city councilor that represents all of Concord, not ward specific. Uh, this is my second time running for office in Concord. I ran against Mayor Jim uh, last election cycle as a first time candidate. Um, did well considering that he's a very popular mayor and has done great things for the city and I was a virtual unknown in the city and want to continue to um, run and be involved and uh, hopefully get our city um, on the right path and keep things in a good good direction. Um, can you describe your plan to ensure equal access to opportunities and resources for all residents, regardless of race, ethnicity, or background? Yeah, so I think working closely with the school district, um, a lot of people I've realized don't realize that the city and the school district aren't necessarily aligned. Um, they're two different things. A lot of people seem to think that the city has much more control over the schools than they do. I think that the city and the schools can work much more closely together um, to be able to uh, continue to create opportunities. Um, city can continue to pour resources into. We have beautiful parks here. We have beautiful services. Um, and I think that we need to keep um, improving those and also improving access to those. A lot of people don't know that uh, the resources that we have here in town and we need to be able to, you know, Concord needs to be its first advocate. Concord needs to go to its residents and say, these are the things that are available. First can commit to throwing my weight behind the work that others have started. So for example, I know that Ward 10 Councilor Xandra Rice Hawkins and Ward 5 Councilor Stacey Brown began the process of creating a comprehensive listing of board um, and committee appointments and were, have been working to make those known to the community. So I think that's a very uh, positive first step in just letting residents know what opportunities are available to engage then we know there are many barriers to civic engagement. So I would like to work to break those down. We've seen a great example from uh, mayoral candidate Kate West in terms of translating materials into multiple languages. I know that the current city website has that option, but it's not um, very obvious. So even just letting people know that that tool is there so that they can find out more information. I'm also particularly interested in public transportation. I'd like more residents from all walks of life in Concord to use public transportation, but I think it's especially important to make sure that we are offering public transportation to city meetings and events and advertising that accessibility. So those are a few places where I would first put my energy. And then I think we have further conversations to have as a city about how we can really ensure equal access um, and, ga and engagement for all of us. A few answers here. Um, I think a lot, of it, a lot of it starts with having conversations and, and a willingness to listen and to be open and to understand the needs of our community as a whole. Um, and, and sort of that, uh, that, that starts with understanding that people are coming from different perspectives, different life experiences, um, and, and different availabilities in their own lives and people have jobs, they have families, they have maybe language barriers, transportation barriers. Um, so what may have worked 20 years ago, um, we may have different needs now. I mean, there are a lot of different type of people that have different situations going on. Um, language is one, um, you know, translating uh, documents, uh, making meetings more accessible, whether it's by time, using virtual resources, that sort of thing. Um, and we, not, we may not even know what some of the barriers are until we really engage with diverse members of our community. We need, we need to learn, we need to hear from people. What uh, do they not know? Um, is, it a, is it a matter of timing? Is it a matter of money? Let, let's find out. Let's at least open the door and start those conversations. So I think the very first step is making sure that no matter who you are or where you live or what you look like, that you have access to the city council meetings and your city councilors so that you can communicate what your needs are. So right now, we are in a, s a state culturally 
and um, infrastructurally in terms of resources where our citizens, whether it's a lack of a feeling of belonging or a lack of intentional access, are unable to express exactly what it is that could help them be able to participate within our community. So I would say one of the very first things is making sure that we're intentional about providing transportation to meetings, having meetings at a time when people are able to get there, translating into different languages so that folks that don't necessarily speak English as a first language have an opportunity to communicate what it is that's important to them and what would help them thrive in Concord. And I think another key component is also making sure that people are valued and feel valued from a cultural aspect. There's a lot of stigma around being unhoused or being disabled or being from another country and having uh, moved here from another country. And so another aspect is it's the city's responsibility to hold events and be intentional in their practices um, to include folks and make sure that they know that this city is built for them too. Uh, well, I mean, that's part of the work I want to see from the, uh, the belonging, the diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging uh, citizens uh, steering committee. Um, I would like to, and also the consultant that I think we really need to facilitate this, is to look at what policies we need to implement, look at what areas we need to focus on, but also to prioritize so that we know, like, where should our efforts go first? What, what are the, you know, what's the, what are the most important things or, or what are the most foundational things? Because I think that an effort towards equity uh, and inclusion has to be building blocks, you know? And so what I would hope to come out of that process would be uh, an understanding of what steps we have to take and what kind of timeline we need to use. Uh, so, you know, I can't answer specific policies because that's what I want to come out of a citizen-driven uh, process. Second question on DEIJB, or diversity within our community. Um, it's a, how will you work to increase diversity and pre uh, representation within city government um, and leadership positions? Well, I mean, there are a couple of ways to address that. One is that the mayor uh, nominates candidates for uh, city uh, committees, uh, and I'll be looking uh, for candidates uh, that are qualified, both uh, folks who uh, uh, represent our traditional, historical uh, uh, community, but also people who represent our uh, emerging uh, BIPOC uh, uh, population. Uh, and uh, I think the, the, the key here is, though, is to look for folks who have an interest in areas, who have some skills or qualifications that would help inform their participation on a committee. Um, I mean, I think that it's quite possible with this election that we will have a, uh, a more diverse city council. Uh, but that kind of diversity, you know, really uh, relies on the electorate and relies on the voters. Um, but, I mean, I have traditionally tried to mentor uh, you know, people uh, who I think have potential as leaders, um, and there's at least one of those can one candidate in that regard who is on the ballot now. Uh, there are actually a couple of candidates on the ballot who I have tried to mentor, um, and by that I mean just trying to um, identify them, encourage them, uh, you know, help them understand how city government works. So if I am fortunate enough to be elected mayor, I'll certainly be looking for opportunities to uh, pr you know, uh, promote diversity on our various city committees. Uh, and I'll continue to try to be a mentor to uh, emerging leaders in the new American and BIPOC community. I also have questions that I haven't had a chance to have answered yet, in part because we've been going through this campaign process, about what it really means if the city provides stipends to, to, to people. Does that mean that they're city employees? Does that, uh, you know, uh, open us up to, uh, you know, providing city benefits, things like that. One of the things I've thought about, particularly in, in, in regards to the uh, steering committee for the DEIJB effort, has been to look at organizations like the Endowment for Health uh, and uh, the Charitable Foundation, New Hampshire Charitable Foundation, New Hampshire Endowment for Health, to see if there might be grant money available that might provide stipends. 
uh, so that we don't have to uh, we don't have to deal with the issues that might arise if this was city money. Um, but I'm willing to look at that. Like I was saying before, a big piece of making sure that our representatives are reflective of the community at large is intentionally addressing barriers that impact folks that are not historically represented. And in order to do that, you need to be intentional and purposeful about going and asking those community members what barriers they face to access and what the city can do to help. You know, one of the most important things that I've found is that I, it's important to recognize that as one person, one representative, I don't have all of the answers, but the community members facing those barriers do. They know what they need in order to be able to serve and participate and what would make them feel like they belong and what would help them be successful. So the number one priority is to ask. And in order to do that, I found that the city council relies heavily on participation in city council meetings in order to gather that type of information from constituents. But the issue is that not only is it not accessible for everyone to be able to get to those meetings, but that there's one issue of a language barrier, but then there's also the issue of feeling welcome or knowing that your voice will be heard. I would say a few things that could be done. One is making sure that public transportation runs during times when the meetings are and to where the meetings are that the meetings sometimes move to other locations so that folks don't necessarily have to take transportation to get to the meetings, to make sure that there are translators so that folks can understand what their policymakers and representatives are discussing and they can weigh in on the projects. Um, I also think that in terms of the city's DEIJB committee, that in order to address barriers that people face, like transportation, like childcare, that we would need to provide stipends to those individuals. People historically are unable to show up and be heard because of the barriers they face, and they know the nuance of those barriers, and they know what those barriers are specifically. So giving them the autonomy through a stipend would help them to remove those barriers the most efficiently for themselves. Lastly, I would say that if we're going to use city council meetings as our main source of information for what the constituents need from us, then it would do us, uh, it would be in our best interest to allow for public comment on any topic at all monthly city council meetings. Thank you for your question. Yeah, I, I appreciate that question. Um, and this is something that, that I raised um, about a year or two ago, and I've, I've been very vocal on this. Uh, as reported by the Concord Monitor, despite about 14% of people in Concord being people of color, only 1% of those on city boards and commissions are people of color. And this is problematic for a number of reasons. Uh, these positions are often stepping stones to other positions. Uh, these positions can really help build people's resumes to help them grow their own career or their own professional networks, which is incredibly important, uh, particularly for younger people as they, they start off their careers or grow their careers. And also, as you say, for, for resources. Um, city boards and commissions have a lot of power in terms of uh, how the city moves forward, uh, how resources are, are, are divvied up. Um, so I think this is, this is a huge issue, and it's, it's not something that I think has been looked at enough. Um, so I think we've, we first have to acknowledge that there's a problem. I mean, 14% and 1%, that, that's a pretty stark uh, disparity. Um, so we then acknowledge that. How do, how do we make it better? How do we improve that? Um, what, what's the process for people applying to serve on boards or commissions? What's the process for who's selected and who's appointed? What's the process for outreach? What's the process to ensure there's diverse representation on these various boards and committees? Um, so that's where we need to start. Um, and as I've been saying all along, this is not altruism. Diverse groups produce better outcomes and make better decisions. So we are all paying the cost for this lack of diversity. So we really need to take action now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. So this is a complex one. As someone who is in the middle or nearing the end of a campaign, I have learned a lot about just how difficult it is um, to run for office and be engaged. It, it takes time and money, unfortunately, um, opportunity um, to access resources and, and to get to know people. 
Um, in order to diversify city boards, that was the question, right? Yeah. Is, right? <laughs> boards and committees and leadership. I think we really have to think about how we, how business as usual operates and if it is serving all Concord residents or if there are changes that we want to make. I am not the expert in this area, so I would want to draw on folks who have worked in other organizations and other municipalities to achieve these goals. I don't think that we need to make this up out of thin air. I think there are examples all around us of places that have been successful in addressing these questions. And so as a person who loves research, I would start by looking to those other organizations and bringing ideas back for us to discuss. Well, again, this ties into my previous point. I think Concord needs to do a better job, the city, of going to the people, of saying this is what we need, going to the communities that are underrepresented, underrepresented and saying, these are the positions, the boards that we have openings on. These are the type of candidates that we're looking for. Who in this community is available that would be a great fit? You know, at the end of the day, I want to see the best candidate for the role, but I also want to see representation for all of Concord's communities. And again, Concord needs to do a better job of reaching out directly to these communities. Right now, you know, the process for board appointments is city councilor will just appoint, they'll make a recommendation to the mayor who then works with the um, city manager um, to make that appointment. Again, you know, we need to go directly to the communities and say, this is what we're looking for. Who do you have? Who can you recommend? It is important to engage and involve marginalized communities in decision-making processes. What are some ways that you can engage this population in Concord to ensure their voices are heard and that their needs are being met? Absolutely. Great question. And this has come out a few times during this campaign. I think one of the key ways is, like you said, going to these communities. The idea has been discussed of having moving city council meetings instead of just having the meeting at City Hall all the time. Let's pick a site in the Heights where so many of our new residents live. Let's pick a site somewhere else. Let's move around so people that don't have access can still attend these meetings. You know, let's possibly talk about the idea of changing time, date, but let's do these things where we are being proactive because there are so many communities that just, despite everything, can't do it, can't make it. Yeah, so this is a process, right? Relationship building, trust building, which has to underlie any of these conversations where people who feel vulnerable or who have been marginalized trust that they can share what they need um, with their leaders. So I would start by showing up to community events, trying to sit with people and earn trust. And I don't think that that's a one and done kind of thing. I don't think you can show up to one meeting and have earned trust and respect and, and gotten to a place where you have open lines of communication. I think it takes time. And so I personally am willing to commit that time. I'd also like to see the city council do something that I've heard other members of council talk about, which is take the meetings to other locations. Now, I think if we say we're going to hold a meeting in Penacook and we're going to hold one monthly meeting here at the Heights Community Center, that's great. We need to do that for a long time. We can't simply do one meeting and say no one showed up, right? So these relationships take time and progress takes time. So. I think we need to start with some very simple acts of bringing the table to the people, moving the location of meetings, um, offering translation services, and really demonstrating repeatedly that we care to hear those voices and that we're willing to reach out. Do you, think, uh, do you think moving meetings to a different, different locations is possible? And I don't see why it wouldn't be possible. What do you think would be a barrier to that? A sense of how we've done things traditionally mm -hmm. and a hesitancy to move them. I know Concord TV broadcasts the meetings, and so right. I imagine there are some technical challenges. 
but I also feel really confident that those are challenges that can be overcome. They seem to me like problems that can be solved, not reasons not to do something. Yeah, I, I think this sort of relates to some of the other answers, um, but there are some other things as well. Um, there's, there's new federal guidance now called Justice 40, um, which means that under certain federal programs that under-resourced neighborhoods and communities, at least 40% of those resources are directed towards those neighborhoods. Um, and in New Hampshire, we don't have too, too many of those Justice 40 communities, but we do have one here in Concord. It's not too far from where we're sitting right now, kind of south of, uh, of the airport. So um, I think there's a real opportunity to partner with others that are engaged on this work. Um, and it's uh, very similar to what I mentioned before. I it's about engagement. It's about rep understanding the value that diverse um, representation can bring to our community and how this will really grow the pie and expand economic opportunity. Uh, I do want to focus on making those meetings more accessible for people. But I do also believe that that is not the only way to outreach to people. And so it would also do this community a service if we were intentional about creating events specifically geared towards our community members that are not represented well within our government and the activities and services that we currently provide. That we go out of our way to create spaces and opportunities for folks that have been, quite frankly, ignored. So I think that another aspect would be to collaborate within the community to ask people, what would get you invested? What, what do you want to see? What do you need to see in order to feel included, in order to have what you need, and in order to be able to participate? Um, so as much as I do think that strengthening the way that the city council holds meetings and access to those meetings as a way and a method to connect with constituents, I think it is also important that we go outside the box and we show up at businesses and we show up at local events put on by the organizations around Concord. You know, we have a lot of wonderful organizations that help a lot of the people in our community that are sort of in the blind spots of city council and the city government right now. Mm. Um, and I also think it's important to invest, to invest in those communities and in those projects. I would love to have more contact with, uh, with our, all of our communities in the city. Um, you know, I look for opportunities to meet with people. I was just meeting with, a, uh, with uh, one of the store owners up here on, on Loudon Road uh, this morning after I had a meeting here uh, with the uh, uh, English as a Second Language uh, class. Uh, and so I'm always looking for opportunities to, to, to speak with folks in the city to understand what their issues are, to understand what their challenges are. Um, and I would be open to you know, other ways to uh, learn more about what their challenges are. And, what, you know, and, and again, I think that we've had three really good listening sessions uh, at the very beginning of the DEIJB process. And I would expect that the uh, Citizen Steering Committee would hold more hearings. And, and look and have more information gathering sessions uh, that would uh, surface issues that uh, you know uh, all of our communities are dealing with. I've heard the suggestion that maybe we have uh, city council meetings at some different locations. Uh, you know, in other words, not just have them in city hall. Maybe have one up here. Uh, one of the things I want to be sure if we do that, if we did that, one of the things that I would want to be sure about would be that we would be able to have Concord TV live broadcast because a lot of people rely on being able to stream the Concord, uh, stream city council meetings, uh, zoning board meetings, planning board meetings. I'm always surprised at how many people actually watch them and rely on them. So I wouldn't want to cut off access to other people who watch from home uh, you know, to move the meetings around. But uh, another thing I've thought about is having city council listening sessions, and maybe this is what you're thinking of, and have listening sessions for the city council uh, around the city at different locations so that that might be more accessible to folks so that people could come and we basically maybe not hold a city council meeting, maybe not vote, um, but be able to have the city council come to the Heights Community Center 
uh, come go to the Be uh, Beaver Meadow uh, 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 Clubhouse, uh, go to other locations, maybe go to the Abbott Downing School if we could coordinate it with the school board um, and have listening sessions in those lo locations like that so that we'd be more accessible to people. I thought that maybe you, you might also mention that uh, uh, the city website is not accessible. Information is that the nothing is accessible, even. Oh well, the that's meetings. already that's already that's already so on my agenda. Is to see if we could take a look at making the website easier for everyone to use. It's not, it's not just a website. Actually, it is uh, the need of employing people from different areas, different uh, backgrounds. Uh, I think if if uh, we have a community uh, a community that uh, you know in has uh, had people from different countries that don't speak English. Mm -hmm. I think they, they deserve to have uh, representation. If we have someone employed that speaks Swahili or Nepal, mm -hmm. or I think they can translate the information, they mm -hmm. can translate meetings, and uh, everybody can be able to access information. Yeah. I, think, I think that's a, a strategy, and that was a, that's a strategy to make sure that uh, everybody's included, and I was wondering if that's part of your uh, I the would client. look at that, but you know, I mean, when we say it's easy, it's easy to say we should have somebody there to translate. My question is, how many languages? Do, what languages are we going to need? Are we going to have somebody there as a translator who's not going to do anything because no one's going to be there who needs a translator, or are we going to, or are we going to have somebody there who speaks one language, but the person who's there who needs translation services needs another language? I mean, how do we do that efficiently and effectively? Uh, you know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm open to those ideas, but I have to think about, if I am there, I have to think about the practical application. How does it really work? Who do we get? You know, uh, uh, you know what languages do they need to speak? Uh, you know, do we need more than one person there? And, and is that an effective uh, use of the taxpayer dollars? So, you know, all of those things, I think, are on the table. But I'm really interested in how does it practically work? How do we functionally do that? Um, you know, in terms of, the, the, of translating document, you and I have talked offline about the idea of tra translating uh, materials and documents. But again, I need to know logistically, how does that really work? How, how do we functionally do that? How many different languages do we have to address uh, in order to be you know, open to the majority of our, of our population? Yeah. Um, my last question on the idea of diversity. Um, how will you ensure that city services and resources are uh, uh, distributed uh, equally across all neighborhoods, especially historically underserved areas? Yeah. What, what areas would you define as historically underserved? The Heights, um, Pentecook, um, you know, how do you, how do you define historically underserved I neighborhoods? I think that question, I, I think it's obvious. The okay, Heights. all right. Um, I, I don't, I don't think Pentecook is part of that. I well, I don't know. I talked to people in Pentecook. I mean, I know that you you're, you're not going to. I, I think live there. I've been oh, here for three do. years, so I, I know you do. Yeah. Uh, but you know, I was canvassing Pentecook last weekend, and they were talking to me about how they were underserved because uh, they weren't getting their leaf pickup. Now I know that's not what you're talking about, but people, you know. A lot of people in other parts of the, of the city also think that they're underserved in one way or another. I mean, I would be open to, list, you know, to sitting down and talking to representatives of the Heights community to represent, you know, and to talk to them about what services are the, do they not have access to, what services do they need, uh, and see if there's a city solution to that. Uh, you know, I'm always open to uh, having those conversations. Um, you know, in terms of, uh, you mentioned uh, bus transportation, for example. That's a city-county issue, um, and I know that you know, uh, uh, you know, advocates for more bus transportation have been on the transportation policy advisory committee that oversees the city part of of, uh, of, of bus tra transit, um, and and uh, and uh, so far, I, I know it's been a challenge uh, because we rely on county and federal dollars to supplement city dollars relative to that. I mean, I, I've wanted for a long time to have bus, buses available in the evening. I was in Pentecook talking to a young man there who was complaining about the fact that as a, 
as a as a twenty something young person, he couldn't get access to bus transportation to take him downtown uh, in the evening uh, and bring him back. So there are a lot of aspects to trying to expand bus transportation uh, that uh, you know I'm happy to I'm happy to look at, uh, but we have to understand that you know that bus that the bus transit is provided by you know a county agency that we for whom we supplement i think that when we look at the budget there's a clear discrepancy as to what the city considers to be important i think that we need to invest in the public library in pennacook and make sure that it's open more than 10 hours a week. I think that we need to make sure that we, when ha we have a lot of constituents come to us and say, there needs to be lights at Keach Park so that it's safe and so that we can play, that we prioritize that and we make that happen, especially in contrast to a lot of the projects that are prioritized across the city. I think that when the pools are open in the summertime, we need to keep in mind that that's some folks only relief from the heat and it should be a priority for us to keep those open, keep them accessible, pay lifeguards what is necessary in order to staff the pools. I think that when it comes to public transportation, we need to make sure that our budget reflects that we care about the constituents that might not be able to afford a car, but we care about whether or not you can get groceries. We care about whether or not you can participate in the economy and whether or not you can get to a job. So I think that we can reflect in our budget how much we do care about every conquered citizen by redirecting our intention and our investment into areas that better serve the community as a whole. Um, how will you ensure that city services and resources are distributed equitably across all neighborhoods, especially historically underserved areas? And that's a tough question that I think is one of those things where it requires constant reminders. You constantly need to be reminded that this is something that needs to be done. We need to constantly be focused on these communities to make sure that it's top of mind that we are serving them. So I think, again, working with these communities also, um, I'm sorry, could you repeat the second part of the question? Sure. Um, especially how can you make sure that um, resources are distributed equitably to all neighborhoods, especially historically underserved areas? So, you know, being top of mind, but also, you know, keeping that reference, I think, you know, being more transparent with the government of not allowing self-dealing, of, of being open of the decision-making process will also allow these historically underserved neighborhoods to, to get more equitable access. So I think uh, tracking data, tracking what programs are happening, where they're happening, and really paying attention to those patterns is one part of it. I also think there's this concept um, that I know I've heard Mayor Boulay speak to before that fair and equal are not the same, and so that we need to look at the area of greatest need and really work to address the needs that present themselves in our community and not let um, an equal distribution of resources feel fair or equitable when we know that there's an area of greater need, we need to meet that need. Because we are only as healthy as the least healthy of our residents. We are only as successful as a community as the least successful member of the community. We have to rise up and lift all of us together in order to truly be a safe and welcoming space for everyone. Yeah, I think it's very similar to, to what we were talking about before about under-resourced communities. And I think we really need to, I'm, I'm, I'm a data guy, I'm a numbers guy. So I think really looking at historically how different neighborhoods have been served, different communities have been served. Um, and this may not just be, you know, I mean, something like a, a community center is sort of top of mind, but it really goes much deeper than that. Um, uh, green space initiatives, for example, um, looking at transportation, you know, language access. Uh, there, there are so many different things. It, it's hard to list them just in our conversation now. Again, I think it really goes back to engaging with diverse perspectives and hearing from different members of our community. Um, they know better than, um, than somebody like me, for example. <laughs>
Okay, let's jump into economic development. Excellent. And my first question is, what strategies would you employ to attract businesses and entrepreneurs fostering economic growth and opportunities for all residents? Yeah. Uh, a couple of things. One is that when I first became involved in city government, this is before I was elected, uh, the mayor appointed me to uh, a committee called the Economic Development Advisory Committee. Uh, and uh, we sunsetted that committee uh, a few years ago when we hired an economic development director. Um, that position is now unfilled, uh, although we have more, uh, we have expanded the community development department where that, that uh, position resided. Um, and I think we have a much more robust community development structure because of that. I would consider, and I've said that I would like to reinstitute the Economic Development Advisory Committee uh, and fill it with business leaders uh, who can help the city uh, develop a, a better strategy for attracting uh, different kinds of business. Uh, and I think that that means larger businesses like the proposed moving, uh, the proposed relocation of Pitco up here on the Heights, working with businesses like Grapponi, you know, who just opened the Mazda dealership on Manchester Street, but also in my vision to work with smaller business owners, uh, you know, with business people who are trying to create startup companies, uh, whether it's small mom and pop shop shops or stores, or whether it's uh, more entrepreneurial. Uh, tech-driven businesses. Right. Uh, you know, you know, you connected me uh, uh, yesterday uh, with uh, a young woman who is trying to open a, a hair or expand a hair salon and was interested in the development at the Steeplegate Mall. Um, and, uh, you know, earlier we were talking about the fact that I did make a contact and that that's a possibility, not a guarantee, but something possible. I think government needs to be in a position to work with businesses to work with entrepreneurs and to help guide and provide contacts and connections. I mean, there are a lot of organizations and agencies that are out there to help people, particularly who want to start businesses. The Small Business uh, Administration is one, uh, which was the regional uh, office here was run until recently by mm -hmm. a Concord resident. Uh, we also have the Small Business Development um, uh, Agency that's at the Uni University of New Hampshire which also is available and has resources. So I think that we need to make sure that the city uh, have, the, have an economic devel development advisory council, uh, have them uh, advising the community development department on how to draw, attract business to the city and how to keep business here, how to retain business. Uh, make sure that there are uh, ways for people who are interested in starting businesses to gain access to resources through the city um, but also, another thing I'd like to do is to recreate uh, the mayor's uh, business visitation program, which is a program that uh, existed a few years ago, again, where the mayor and representatives of community development would, vis would visit both existing businesses to find out what challenges they're facing, to find out you know, challenges that, uh, in doing business that we might be able to help address, but also to visit prospective businesses, businesses who might be thinking about moving to Concord or businesses who might potentially expand in Concord uh, and see what we can do to facilitate them, you know, coming to the city. It's my perception that we have a lot of brilliant business people and young entrepreneurs in Concord already, but that the issue is that it is near impossible for the majority of people to afford to live here, to open a business here, and to sustain a livelihood here. So I think a major component of being able to attract and sustain young people and young entrepreneurs and give them the opportunity to create successful businesses here in Concord is to make sure that it is affordable for them to live here and to run their businesses here. I think that a perspective that I have brought to these discussions that is unique to me is my understanding, again, that our homeless population is stigmatized and often thought of broadly as a group of people that only need help and will forever need help. However, my personal experience is that a lot 
of folks that are facing those types of barriers are brilliant, we're ready to open businesses, ready to work hard, and there isn't an opportunity to for livelihood right now in our city. So I think that if we do the work to find those solutions to housing, invest in the folks in our community that are suffering now, that need help now, but we give them the resources that they need and the support they need to get through their barriers that they're facing currently, then they will be able to flourish. They will be able to run businesses, open businesses. They'll be able to afford to live here. And that will come back to us tenfold in the way of bolstering the economy with workers, healthy workers that are able to uh, provide for their families. And then they will in turn also contribute by being consumers within our local economy. This is a really good question, and I've gotten to think about this a little bit already in this campaign. Um, sitting down and speaking with a representative from the Chamber of Commerce was really, really interesting and showed me that we have some great resources, some experts in this area in Concord already. So I'm not an expert in economic development. I think we should sit down with our experts, with our Chamber of Commerce, with developers who've already shown a commitment to the Concord community, and talk to them about how we draw in more businesses. I also think that in addition to reaching out, we look at what we have here. I was at the uh, ribbon cutting for a wonderful mural today at the Bank of New Hampshire stage, and that is such a beautiful example of the Chamber of Commerce supporting something, a local arts organization supporting something, and an individual artist coming together to represent what is the best of Concord. Then I bought lunch for Batula's, another pu beautiful example, and I think we both need to reach out to large um, business entities who can help lift the tax base while also lifting up the entrepreneurs within our community who bring out what is the best in Concord. Yeah, great question. As I mentioned, I used to be a, a small uh, small business lender, and some of the early organizations I, I worked for uh, were involved in economic development and, and small business development. Um, I think there are a few opportunities here. Um, tech is a big one. Uh, I went to a great launch event uh, a few weeks ago here in Concord. A really incredible businesses that are starting and growing and doing some really neat stuff. Uh, I think there's a lot can be done there. You know, we're, we're located in between Dartmouth and Manchester and, and the Seacoast and UNH. Uh, we're really geographically positioned uh, to, to leverage off of some opportunities there. Uh, another sector um, I think is the arts and, and music uh, sector. Uh, there's a lot of really great stuff going on here in Concord. Um, sometimes I don't think it's marketed as well as it could be. Um, I think we'd be able to pull in more young people or college students or art uh, fans, music fans to come in. Um, you know, we, I think we really need to figure out as a city how we want to market ourselves to visitors and we really need a consistent approach. Um, to, and, I, and I think the arts and the music scene is one way we really, uh, one place we should really focus on there. So I, this entire campaign, have advocated heavily for Concord being its strongest advocate. I've said it earlier. I've said it in other forms. I'll say it again. We need to be our biggest advocate for ourselves. We need to be out there reaching out to, look, manufacturing is great. Service is great. But we need to evolve. We need to embrace the changing economy we need to start calling up high-tech businesses and selling Concord. Why are we the best place to put a server farm? Why are we the best place to put a solar panel manufacturing plant if we really want to be a manufacturing town? Why do we want to do this? And then let's start targeting those companies. My second question regarding um, economic development, how will you plan to support and promote small businesses owned by uh, the BIPOC community and ensure they have equal access to resources and opportunities? Uh, so I do think that there is a sense of segregation within our community, that there are businesses and uh, opportunities on the heights that are specific to a consumer base on the heights and that there are businesses and opportunities downtown that are specific to that consumer base downtown. I think a really big part of unifying the city and creating opportunities for everyone and specifically our BIPOC business owners is making sure that 
we do the work culturally, infrastructurally, financially to unify our downtown and our community on the heights. So uh, that looks like a lot of things. It still it still looks like investment in transportation. It also looks like what like we were talking about the investment that we put into which areas of the city and why. It also is that cultural aspect of making sure that the the um, businesses that we bolster, the businesses that we uh, choose to create opportunities and awards for and that we choose to, as a city, um, hold up and support, that we are being intentional about making sure that that is inclusive of everyone in the city, of every business owner. I think I would expect the, the steering committee to, if, if the steering committee surfaces issues uh, like that, or if issues are brought to me, uh, I would hope that we could, we could address those. Some of those issues are not going to be able to be addressed by city government. Some of those issues are state level, sometimes federal level. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm curious. So what's your plan, by the way, about this steering committee, the IGB committee? You're talking yeah. about that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What's your plan? Well, what do you mean? Um, what's my it's plan? It's not developed yet. No, then it's not developed yet. I mean, what I would hope is that uh, I think first we need to uh, r uh, recruit a consultant, then we need to populate the committee. Uh, and under the with the the facilitation of the of the consultant, you know, develop the committee needs to develop a plan to look at the city with uh, through a diversity, equity, inclusion, justice, and belonging lens to see you know what what steps need to be taken. Uh, you know, I want I, you know it would be easy for me to sit here and say yeah A B C and D that's what I want to do, but that's not driven by that's not driven by by uh, uh, or that might not be driven by the knowledge that we hopefully are going to attain by going through this process. Yeah, sure. So again, I think we have to recognize historically that, that certain groups have been um, have not been able to access the same resources uh, as others. Um, I think it's letting people know that they're welcome here, um, that there is a thriving small business community. We, we want people to succeed. We want people to come to Concord for people that already live here, letting them know what it takes to uh, to start a business. Um, I, I have one friend who um, he was kind of intimidated by by the, the process of, of getting an LLC, and I just it was very for me it was very simple because I, I see this all the time. Uh, he was a little intimidated about setting up an LLC and what that looks like, and I, I showed him how easy it was, and um, just those, those small things, um, you know, connecting people uh, to others that may have experience can help you know demystify certain things you need to do in order to start and grow a business. Great. So I was starting to touch on that a little bit. Um, one of the ideas that I've heard and seen in other communities is um, ar specifically around our food producers in Concord. So if you've been to the Multicultural Festival, which I know you have and you know I have, there's such a wealth of uh, cuisine, diverse food. But we also know that restaurants are extremely challenging businesses to maintain. So there's this model that exists in other small cities of sort of a commercial food space that has small spaces for pop-up restaurants or um, shared overhead costs, you know, of the facility, but individual small entrepreneurs could sell and produce and sell their foods there. I'd love Concord to lean into something like that. I think it would really be a wonderful addition to downtown Concord and provide opportunity for a range of folks who might not ever have the desire to or be in the position to run their own restaurant. Other sort of cooperative spaces around arts entrepreneurs um, and s craftsmen and women, those small businesses, are similar opportunities. We need to think creatively instead of just anticipating that every individual who has some product could have a brick and mortar store. That's not realistic for everyone, particularly folks who may be coming from um, less um, generational wealth, for example. They might not have the funds to risk on an entrepreneurial venture. Yeah, um, I think that the city needs to more fully work with the Chamber of Commerce. I think the Chamber of Commerce can work with some of these initiatives and the city can work with the Chamber to support these businesses. Um, really, at the end of the day, 
you know, spreading the word about these businesses. Maddie's Restaurant over on uh, Fort Eddy Road, I have eaten there a couple times. I, I love that. And I spread the word to, to everyone. You know, it's end of the day spreading the word about these great businesses, but also, um, you know, the city needs to, to work to get the word out, and the city needs to work with the Chamber of Commerce and uh, fully fund our chamber, again, to decide how do we want our economy to grow and how do we want to support our diverse businesses. So now we have one question uh, regarding housing. How will you address the issue of affordable housing in our city? In order to address the issue of affordable housing in our city, I think there are a lot of different things that we need to consider and a lot of different things that we need to do. Number one is redefining what affordable housing really means and what is affordable for most people in Concord. Currently, what we hear is market rate is not affordable for most of the folks in Concord. Uh, additionally, I think that it's important to ensure that when we look at zoning, when we look at partnerships with developers, that we are incentivizing that true affordability, as well as making sure that affordable housing is in all areas of the city, that it's not concentrated to certain spaces and that it's all throughout because no matter where you are in the city, you deserve to be able to afford to live. I think that another important aspect, especially when we're trying to tackle um, affordable housing as it relates to folks that are currently experiencing houselessness is to become more embedded in the organizations within the city that are already doing work with those communities. So um, I understand that the city does have meetings with the Coalition to End Homelessness and works with um, other organizations within the city but I do think there's a lot of room for the city to step up and be even more involved in coordination of those efforts in order to truly see the individualized barriers that folks are facing in regards to housing. Because until you are in the room with people genuinely trying to solve those problems yourself, it's difficult for you to really understand what is necessary in order to achieve a Concord where everyone has a place to live. Well, I think city government has a role to play as a facilitator, as somebody who makes it, uh, uh, who uh, uh, tries to remove barriers. Um, and so I would look for opportunities. For example, um, Dakota Partners, who are building a couple of hundred units in the rail yard uh, of workforce housing, affordable housing. They're trying to build a project up here on the Heights on Old Loudon Road. And the problem is that they have a $1.9 million funding gap. In other words, they can't come up with, they haven't been able to come up with about $1.9 million that they need to move forward with the project. And the project would create 98 units of housing. 10 of them would be market rate. 88 of those units would be uh, for workforce, you know, uh, you know uh, uh, income adjusted housing. Um, so what we're, the city is doing is our community development advisory commi uh, committee uh, is applying for uh, community development block grant money to try to bridge that gap. And at the same time, at uh, our uh, September city council meeting, the city council authorized the city administration to apply for state invest New Hampshire funds to help bridge the other part of that gap. So hopefully between those two efforts, we'll be able to bring in the $1.9 million that will help Dakota partners move forward with their project and create you know, 98 units of housing. That's the kind of thing that the city can do. We can work with developers like that who are working on affordable housing. You know, I mean, we also work with Dakota when they um, uh, were uh, developing the, the South End Rail Yard. There are certain things that the city did to help facilitate that. Um, the uh, property uh, up on Village Street in Penacook, Rosemary's Way, which Catch Neighborhood Housing built, uh, much of which is also affordable, uh, the city sold a piece of land at a very reasonable price 
to catch in order to complete their package or complete their plot of land that they needed to build that. So the city can do certain things to help uh, with uh, create affordable housing. Um, and that's what I would think that we would do. You know, be a, be a helper in those regards. I don't know that, I don't think the city should be in the business of building, per building housing. That's not our business. That's not our, uh, our area of expertise. But we do, not, uh, do, do know how to capture federal and state funds in order to help move projects forward. We have to make it a priority, and we have to make it a priority by writing it into our code or our master plan or whatever document we develop as a city that actually has legal teeth so that when we are working with developers, they are required to assure a certain number of units in each housing project are workforce housing, truly affordable housing, which is different than market rate housing. It's something that we will likely have to subsidize as a city because developers have a bottom line as well, and it can be quite expensive, especially with building costs today. But it's also a, a necessary step. We are facing a housing crisis. Lack of affordable housing is the single greatest correlation to homelessness, and we have to do something in order to protect all the residents of Concord and put us in a position to be resilient and thrive. I mean, obviously, this is this is top of mind, and having worked in housing for for 20 years, um, I think there are a lot of things we can do. I, I think top of mind is we have to make it easier to build housing. Um, there are so many regulatory burdens and administrative burdens, and some of them I'm sure do protect people. Some of them I'm, I'm not so sure. Uh, we really have to take a hard look at that and weigh that versus what is problems are being caused by a lack of housing. I mean, the lack of housing is really causing people harm. It's causing financial and psychological and in some cases physical harm. So we really need to weigh that versus all of these burdens. And it, it is just so difficult uh, to get. So you have very small projects. I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about, you know, huge projects here. Um, here in New England, uh, we small multifamily housing is sort of what we have and uh, what we have to work with, which is fine. Uh, but those projects do take, it is a little harder to absorb upfront costs because those projects are so small. Um, so small multifamily is one key area I think we can focus on. Uh, another area is sort of repurposing underutilized commercial space. So, so my organization, uh, we are growing tremendously, but we just got rid of half of our office space. And this is kind of a consistent trend across the country. We're going to have less commercial real estate, and there's a need for more housing, more residential. So we need to find a way to convert those properties or uh, looking at urban infill, as it's called. Um, many properties downtown, sort of one-story commercial buildings, find ways to, to build those up. I'm not talking skyscrapers, maybe, you know, t two, three stories, that sort of thing. Um, and also just um, looking all over Concord. Um, I, I, rural areas, this may be converting a barn to an apartment. Um, we have some, some former industrial areas here. Those take, uh, those have unique challenges of their own in terms of cleanup, and, and there are resources for that, um, and just finding ways to unlock that and, and partner with others who are active uh, in that space. Um, how will you address the issue of affordable housing in our city? That's a tough issue. Again, another issue that has an evolving answer. Um, Throughout this campaign, I've tried to focus on creative solutions to problems here. And I've looked at, I just did a cursory, just board wanted to get the answer search. There's 380-ish Airbnbs in Concord. Now, not all of those are able to be, are dual families that are able to be converted to um, long-term occupancy, but the city can work to put some incentives in place we don't want to punish people that want to have short-term rentals, but let's in try to find ways to incentivize them to say, you know what, maybe it's better for me to turn my short-term rental into a longer-term rental. Again, 380 units, let's say about 100. That's not a lot, but that is housing that we didn't have before, and it's a creative solution to the problem. Mm. One minute. Tell us why people should vote for you as the mayor of the city of Concord. Uh, because I have a lot of experience. I've been on city council for 10 years, as I said, when we started. Uh, I've served on numerous committees uh, within the city. Um, I have chaired numerous, committee, uh, numerous committees, both uh, city committees and also nonprofit committees. So I know, I know the process of moving things forward. I know how 
uh, to uh, run a meeting um, and how to try to build consensus to move projects and, uh, and priorities forward. Um, also, uh, I'm told I'm a good listener. Even when I don't agree with people or even when I cannot uh, do what somebody asks me to do, um, I will always listen to them, give them an ear, and give them a respect uh, that they deserve. Um, and that's, those are the qualities that I would bring to being mayor. Um, I would want to be mayor for the entire city, uh, for the people who didn't vote against me as well as the people who did vote for me. Uh, and uh, I would want to advance our city uh, into this 21st century, uh, taking advantage of our opportunities, uh, dealing with our, uh, our challenges, uh, and making Concord a better city than it was when I first took office. Thank you for the interview. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, I would say one of the reasons to vote for me is because there are not a lot of candidates historically that have the perspective that I do. I was an elected official that was unable to finish her term because as a renter, I was unable to stay in the apartment I was renting within my district. I know what it's like to lose your housing for no fault of your own. I know what it's like to try to find affordable housing in this city and not be able to find anything. I know what it's like to have to ask for help, to have to rely on my community members in order to survive. I know what it's like to not be able to afford to fix your car and then to rely on the public transportation in this city to get from place to place. I know what it's like to try to be a young professional and a mom and to fi find childcare that's affordable at the same time. I know what it's like to do everything that you can to get your head above water and still feel like you're drowning. And the only reason that you're able to survive is the community members around you. As mayor, I want to make sure that it's not just your immediate community members, but it's the city itself. It's your leaders, it's your representatives that reach out and help you stay afloat. So could you give us about a 30 second, why should we vote for you? Absolutely. Uh, the biggest reason to vote for me is because I love this community. I want to see Concord continue to grow and thrive. I have no agenda going into city council other than protecting the residents of Concord, seeing our community be better, protecting the taxpayers, and that's it. I have nothing else. So if you want somebody who's honest, who's dedicated, that's my pitch. Mm -hmm. That's all I've got, pretty simple. I would like your vote as I pledge to you to listen to your concerns, do my research, reach out to experts, bring voices together around the table, and work to make progress for all of us. I am not afraid to admit when I've learned something new or that I'm wrong. I am honest and hardworking, and I want to give back to this community, which I have made my home. Thank you. Um, housing and energy, clean energy transition are, are two critical areas, both, both as, a, as a country and also locally. Um, and these are also two areas that are really driven by local policies and local decisions. And they're also fairly technical sectors. And I've been working in these areas for 20 years. I kind of understand the, the nuts and bolts of these sectors and how you move housing forward, how you move a, move a solar project forward. Um, so I think doing that in a, in a meaningful way and, and going back to your questions about diversity, equity, and inclusion, doing it in a way that um, is authentic and, and pulls in perspectives and, and empowers those that are living in, in, in neighborhoods and um, are, are impacted by those, those projects is key. Um, and I think my, my track record on inclusivity and DEI speaks for itself. And I think we need to, to push forward with that. Governance may not always be top of mind for people, but I think it's really important. That's why I mentioned it in my campaign and in a few areas here. Uh, our, our Board of Ethics has been vacated. They haven't met in 11 years. And I think that's really something that needs to be looked at and, and restaffed here. Um, and I think diversity, equity, and inclusion also um, uh, feeds into governance. Again, uh, this is not altruism. Diverse groups produce better outcomes. We would all benefit from hearing from the more diverse perspectives of people that live in Concord. Um, increasing civic engagement, 
business engagement, academic engagement. We will all benefit from this. So I think the time is now. And thank you very much. And um, I, I would love to have your support. But whoever you're voting for, please get out and vote on uh, Tuesday, November 7th. It's so important. Please make a voting plan. Uh, get your friends and neighbors. If you have people that have transportation challenges, there are resources available. It's so important to have your voice heard. Please get out and vote on Tuesday.